I'm Jack Gansel and welcome to the Embedded Muse video blog, which is a companion to my free Embedded Muse e-newsletter. In a previous video, I showed that putting a scope or a logic analyzer probe on a node in an embedded system can cause the system to fail. Today, let's look a bit more deeply into what these probes look like electrically. There's some math, but don't panic. It's just basic algebra. We think of a scope probe or a logic analyzer probe as being a, a wire. What could be simpler than a wire? They're not. They're complicated circuits. They have capacitance, inductance, resistance. And these all combine in various ways to create different kinds, different levels of impedance. So here's the math. This is all there's going to be. We're all familiar with Ohm's law. E, E for voltage, equals IR. What could be simpler? There's something called reactance. Capacitors and inductors have this quality known as reactance. And this is a formula for the reactance of a capacitor. It doesn't matter that you understand the formula. The important thing is to note that in the divisor, there's frequency as well as capacitance factored in. In other words, reactance varies depending upon the frequency applied to the capacitor. Reactance is ohms. It's measured in ohms. It's just like a resistor, except that it has this frequency component. The formula for an inductor is similar, uh, but not quite identical. This next formula is sort of complicated looking. Don't worry about it. The point of this is it shows that we can combine resistance, pure resistance, and reactance to form something called impedance, which I've been talking about. Impedance, too, is measured in ohms, except since reactance is involved, and since reactance varies with frequency, impedance, too, is a function of frequency. And finally, we can derive a new form of Ohm's law. I equals E over Z over impedance. It's just like the original form of Ohm's law, except now the current flow is, is a function of impedance, which is a function of frequency. So the current flow will vary depending upon the frequency. When you buy a scope probe, you look at the probe, it probably says something like 10 million ohms on it. That's a pretty high impedance. Matter of fact, it's so high that putting that 10 million ohm probe on any node isn't going to cause any problems at all. The problem is that rating is a lie. It's not really true. Look at this graph. This shows the impedance of a scope probe as a function of frequency. So on the vertical axis, we see ohms, the impedance, and then uh, frequency across the horizontal axis. There's three curves shown, a curve for a, a scope probe with five picofarads of capacitance, one with 10 picofarads, and one with 50 picofarads, because capacitance is a domineering effect in uh, scope probes. And as you can see, at DC, yeah, right, 10 mega ohms is great, but none of us measure DC. As you go to higher frequencies, that resistance, that impedance goes down. At 100 megahertz, with a 50 picofarad probe, you're talking about a, a handful of ohms. Putting that probe on a node, on any node, is going to cause the system to crash. Tektronix is one of the few companies that does a great job of characterizing the impedance of their probes. And here's a graph from one of their data sheets for their TPP-1000 probe. It's a four picofarad probe. And as you can see, sure enough, as the frequency goes up, the impedance goes down drastically. This is a $1,000 probe. We're not talking about some sort of a Walmart probe. Here's another typical probe. This one is 10 picofarads. Very common to find 10 picofarad pro probes in, in our labs. This is about a $300 probe. I mean, it's still not something that you're going to get at Radio Shack. And indeed, we can see from this graph that at 100 megahertz, which isn't very fast by today's standards, at 100 megahertz, this thing is like, it has a, an impedance of 159 ohms. It's like putting a 159 ohm resistor across your, your node. We derived a new form of Ohm's law where we can get current as a function of impedance. And here is an excerpt from a TI data sheet for a typical logic gate that we would use in a modern system. And in yellow, the data sheet shows us how much current that gate can drive as a function of the power supply voltage. In red is how much current the probe needs. In other words, if you're driving this gate with a fairly high voltage, it can put out 9 milliamps. But the probe, just the probe alone, needs 14 milliamps. And what that means, of course, is you probe that node, the gate stops being able to drive the rest of your logic, and the system crashes and dies. So what do we do? 
you can buy what's called an active probe, which typically has less than one picofarad of capacitance. They're fabulous devices. But they're going to run you about $5,000 each. As a matter of fact, not long ago, Agilent came out with a 30 gigahertz oscilloscope. And I called them up and I said, wow, this is cool, but what do you do for probes? And they said, oh, no problem. We've got a solution. You can buy probes from us. They're $29,000 each. You know, four of those are going to buy you a house in the Midwest. There are some alternatives. Here's a probe we can make. You take a meter of coax, you solder a 1K quarter watt resistor to the end of it, and now suddenly we have a point, p, 0.5 picofarad probe. And here I'm showing how I've soldered that resistor to a node I want to probe on a board. And you'll see the ground wire is also soldered fairly close to the node. The, uh, the trick here, though, is that your scope has to have a 50 ohm impedance. Most modern scopes will let you set that. It's a controllable setting. If you have an older scope, then you can get this little adapter from DigiKey for about $50, which will do the same thing. But the bottom line is that suddenly you have a probe with this characteristic at 100 megahertz instead of 159 ohms. We're talking 3,200 ohms. It's a heck of a probe for about $2 worth of parts. It's not as convenient as a probe that you can just clip on here, clip on there, but it's a cost-effective and attractive. As I mentioned, it's not just scope probes. It's any probe you're using to get data out of your system. I mean, here's an example of a nice little USB logic analyzer with all these probes and these nice little grabbers. Better look at the specs. These often have 10 to 15 picofarads of capacitance. It can cause all the problems that we've been talking about today. Finally, there's two general kinds of probes. There's a times one probe, which means whatever voltage you're measuring is the voltage shown on the scope. There's also a times 10 probe, which means the scope shows a level one-tenth of what's actually being probed. Most scopes today will automatically adjust the scale, so you don't even really see this half the time. However, the times one probes are awful. They typically have 30, 40, 50. I've even seen them with 100 picofarads of capacitance. If you have any times one probes in your lab, gather them all up and donate them to Goodwill. They have no place in a modern digital lab. So today we've seen how scope probes can actually alter the signal on the node that you're measuring and can cause a system to either crash or perhaps lie to you about what the signal really looks like out there. And we've talked about using terminations in order to correct that. Thanks for watching. And don't forget to check back for more videos and over a thousand articles about better ways of building embedded systems on Gansel.com. And be sure to sign up for the free Embedded Muse newsletter.